Well, good afternoon. Good to see so many of you here today. I am uh, Dr. Bill Barker. I'm the director of the Center for Faith and Inquiry here at Gordon College. It's my delight to welcome all of you to the annual Herman Lectures on Faith and Science in honor of Dr. Robert Herman. Now, today's lecture uh, marks uh, the first of three lectures in this year's lecture series. And I'd like to begin today by sharing with you just a little bit about our honored guest, uh, Dr. Herman. Uh, Dr. Robert Herman is a former adjunct professor and pre-med advisor here at Gordon College. He also taught medical school biochemistry for 22 years at Boston University and then later at Oral Roberts University. In 1981, Dr. Herman left medical education to become the executive director of the American Scientific Affiliation, a 2,200 member society of professionals who are interested in integrating the Christian faith and the natural sciences. And I'm delighted to say we have many uh, members of the ASA, the American uh, Scientific Affiliation, with us here today. And so I just want to extend a welcome to all of you. We're so glad that you are here. Um, as part of Dr. Herman's work with the American Scientific Affiliation, he met Sir John Templeton, with whom Dr. Herman collaborated to write several books and also to help found the John Templeton Foundation. Incidentally, we're, we're quite grateful to that very John Templeton Foundation, uh, which serves as the key sponsor of this lecture series. I'll also simply add that uh, Dr. Herman has authored uh, some of the key biographies uh, of uh, Sir John Templeton. So in light of all these matters, it is truly our delight and our privilege to have Dr. Robert Herman, his wife Betty, their daughter Holly here with us today. Will you please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Robert Herman. And, and truly on behalf of the college, Bob, Betty, Holly, we are so delighted uh, to have you here with us today, so thank you. In just a moment, uh, we will introduce our speaker for the lecture series, but first, uh, I just want to give you a quick overview of what our schedule for today will be like. Uh, we will first hear from the Herman Lecture Series speaker, then following her lecture, we will hear from a professional uh, respondent in, within the field, a colleague within the field, and then finally, we will proceed to our Q&A session, uh, in which I would warmly invite all of you to participate. So then uh, please allow me to introduce to you now uh, our Herman Lecture Series speaker for this uh, occasion, uh, the very accomplished Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. Now, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman is an astronomer, an author, and a speaker. She studies the process of star and planet formation in our galaxy using radio, optical, and infrared telescopes. And she has worked with several major national observatories. She's also interested in national science policy and public science engagement. And she directs the program of dialogue on science, ethics, and religion for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in physics from MIT, discovering the comet named in part in her honor, Wiseman Skiff, in 1987, and continued her studies at Harvard, earning a PhD in astronomy in 1995. She continued her research as a Jansky Fellow at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and as a Hubble Fellow at the Johns Hopkins University and is currently a senior astrophysicist with NASA. She served as a Congressional Science Fellow of the American Physical Society, working with the staff of the Science Committee of the United States House of Representatives. Dr. Wiseman is a Fellow of the American Scientific Affiliation. She has authored several essays addressing the relationship of astronomy and faith, and she frequently gives talks to churches, schools, civic and campus groups on the excitement of scientific discovery. Uh, on a personal note, she would like us to include that she grew up on an Arkansas farm and enjoys late night stargazing, which I understand is her favorite part of astronomy, the, the evening stargazing walks with her parents, uh, her husband, and her pets. Um, it is such a, an honor for us to be able to welcome someone of Dr. Wiseman's esteem. Will you please join me in welcoming her here today? We couldn't do more. Okay, good afternoon. Have you all started to recover from shock? <laughs> um, um, it's quite a day. I wasn't sure if uh, people would uh, uh, kind of come out of the election uh, results here and talk about uh, 
something a little broader, but uh, maybe this is a good idea. Think about things on the scale of the universe um, and kind of get our perspective realigned this afternoon. So it is my distinct honor to be here at Gordon College and uh, to be this year's uh, uh, Herman lecturer. So uh, I appreciate the invitation. We have three spacey lectures this week. So if you come every day, uh, you're going to get a different uh, uh, perspective, a different dose of, of what we're discovering in the universe and how it can relate to the broader questions we have about what it means to be human. Um, the related questions of philosophy and faith. Tonight, I want to open us up with just mainly a look at the beauty and wonder and activity going on in the universe as we're discovering with telescopes. So tonight's presentation is going to be mostly visual, although we will also uh, take a little walk into the philosophical implications and questions um, that our observations uh, tease and bring about, and also discussions of whether they can, for uh, uh, those of us in uh, people of faith, can inspire a sense of, of worship and awe and appreciation in, in accordance with our faith. So we're going to investigate all of that this afternoon. You see walking down the emeritus director of the American Scientific Affiliation, Randy Isaac, and behind him, the esteemed professor of biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Mark Shellhammer, who is also my husband. So, um, <laughs> and they're coming late. All right. <clears throat> Welcome. <laughs> And I think my cousin, Jeffrey Dearman, is in the back. Yay, welcome, Jeffrey. So, all right, so we have a whole room full of VIPs here this evening. All right, so here is just an example of what I would call beauty. In science, we don't often get to just talk about beauty, but tonight, I get to talk about beauty. So here's a, an example of a star-forming region in an interstellar cloud where you can see not only this burst of young stars and the cluster toward the middle of the image, but you can see the colorful gas out of which these stars have recently formed. We live in a beautiful and vibrant universe. I have the privilege of studying things in the universe using different kinds of telescopes. Um, so here's a picture of me with uh, a model of one such telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope there in front of me, and an image that telescope has taken of the Whirlpool Nebula in the background. But I didn't grow up uh, thinking about things scientifically so much. I grew up on a cattle ranch in the country, all right? So I didn't know I was going to be a scientist. I grew up in, in a rural area in Arkansas. Those are uh, the cattle we raised. I'm the one in the middle there, in case there was any confusion. And it was a cold January day there where we had to feed the cattle hay in, in, in the snow. But because I grew up in this area, I spent a lot of time outside. I was able to explore the forests, meadows, and streams. And actually, I really grew to love the natural world. I love animals. I love um, the, the plant life we see around us. And I also appreciated looking up at the night sky. This was an area where you could actually see stars almost from horizon to horizon at night on a clear night and and most people at least in, in our country and in urban areas around the world today um, have a hard time seeing the night sky because um, of our light pollution so have any of you ever had a chance to really be in a really dark place so maybe someplace out west or just see stars from horizon to horizon anybody have had that chance if you haven't good i hope that you will be able to do that sometime so that inspired me to just wonder what's out there and, and, and what would be it be like to explore space. And so I was able to kind of hone my studies to thinking more about studying space, uh, studying things like physics, which is kind of the basic science that you can apply to all kinds of other sciences and engineering, and to think about um, even how biology and chemistry might apply to studies of space I wanted to explore space, but I wasn't quite sure how, whether to be a, an, an astronaut or a, a, an astronomer or an engineer who builds probes going into space. And I went on to university not knowing exactly 
what I wanted to do, but I knew I kind of wanted to do something related to the space program. And during my college years, I took some internships. I hope all of you have a chance to do that in your own college years. And, and I was able to kind of get a, a sample of what it's like working in an engineering lab or working with a, an astronomer or working with a planetary scientist. And eventually I took an astronomy class and really brought it home to me that I could use physics to study space, astrophysics. And I went on then to graduate school to study astronomy. So I, I wasn't sure of my career path. Still, it's always growing and changing. So if you're not sure what you want to do with your life at this point, that's a good thing. You can explore many different avenues. And I didn't know how to do astronomy either. So I, I learned by taking classes. I learned by doing internships with science professors. I even did this one two-week internship out at Lowell Observatory, which is in Arizona, where they taught us how to use telescopes, and I kind of got a sense of what astronomers really do. And because of my work with Dr. Ted Bowl out there, I had the unexpected pleasure of discovering a comet that no one had known of before. So that was a, a surprise my senior year of undergraduate years. And so then I wrote uh, my senior thesis that I had to write to get my degree about uh, studying that comet, which was uh, discovered alongside a staff astronomer there who's a real professional, uh, Brian Skiff, who actually took the image that, uh, of the sky on which I found the comet originally, and then he was able to go out, and I alongside just learning from him, to, to reconfirm that comet in the sky. So I always appreciate Brian Skiff, and the comet is named after us, Comet Wiseman Skiff. I didn't name it, but, um, but that's uh, an, unexpected, uh, uh, an unexpected accelerant for me to go on into astronomy, so you never know what's around the corner. So what is astronomy telling us today about the heavens and the universe? Well, here is a beautiful image taken with a brand new camera that's been installed on the Hubble Space Telescope. And it shows us a really crowded cluster of stars. If we were to look at this cluster with a telescope on the ground, we'd just see the light all blended together. But because this telescope is in space, it gets really crisp images. It's above the atmosphere, so you can differentiate star from star. And so you can actually tell that there's a whole lot of different stars in this cluster. And you can also tell that the stars are not all the same, right? This is this dense globular cluster, as we call it, is called Omega Centauri. And you can see red stars and blue stars and yellow stars, all different colors. The colors represent different temperatures of the outer atmospheres of these stars. And yet these stars, even though they even also look like they're different brightnesses, they're pretty much at the same distance from us because they're gravitationally held near to each other in the same cluster. So we can tell just from looking at this image that stars are not all the same. So astronomers study stars to understand their differences, why they're different, why some of them have different compositions than others. But here I just want to show you how fantastically beautiful stars can be. Um, in this picture, it seems to me like they look like a collection of gemstones, which I find particularly compelling. And so the study of the heavens has always invoked deeper senses of wonder and awe and curiosity and inspiration. Even philosopher Kant said that two things continued to fill his mind with ever-increasing awe and admiration. And those two things are the starry heavens above him and the moral law within him. And I think that's just a fascinating duality that he picked out to kind of contemplate with a sense of growing admiration. One is the heavens, and I would expand that to say the natural world, as we're looking at the things very large in cosmology or very small in terms of our genetic makeup or even smaller in terms of subatomic physics, we can be forever uh, uh, intrigued by more and more detail that we're seeing and more curious as to how we fit in. And then the questions of moral law continue to fill the conscience and the conscious conversations of our society. What, what is justice? Who gets to decide? Why do we all have a sense of right and wrong? Who gets to implement what's good and bad? Why are there differences across cultures and yet a common sense that there is such a thing as right and wrong? So these conversations continue even today. 
And they're inspired in part by looking around us. Let's just explore a little bit of that beauty, a little bit more. The universe is beautiful. Stars continue to form out of beautiful gas. The gas itself gets lit up in turn by the stars that recently formed because as stars form, they shine, especially the massive stars, shine very powerful photons of light back into the surrounding gas cloud out of which they formed and that ionizes the gas. Ionized gas uh, uh, emits visible colors that we can see. So when we see colorful nebulae, which is what we call anything fuzzy in the sky, a colorful nebula generally can signify recent star formation. Well, where's that going on? Here's a region of the sky that some of you might be familiar with. Anybody know what region of the sky this is? I think I heard Orion, that's right. So this is a picture taken with a telescope on the ground. Um, not all telescopes have all the same capabilities. So this, this is a telescope that has a very wide field of view. So you can see a wide area of the sky. You see this constellation known as Orion. Um, Orion is sometimes known as a warrior or a hunter. So here's Orion's belt, here's Orion's sword. Um, you can see this bright blue star Rigel down here. You can see this red giant star up here. Anybody know what star that is? Yeah, right. All right, so Betelgeuse is a big, unstable star. It's probably going to explode any day now in the next few million years, something like that. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's just about to pop. Um, but if you look closely at some of these stars, even with binoculars, you can see something fuzzy around them. And um, as I said, astronomers call anything fuzzy a nebula. So some of these nebulous regions, we'd like to know a little bit more about, especially that one right there. If we look closely at that with a telescope that gives us higher angular resolution, we can see more detail. So I'm going to zoom in on that with the Hubble Space Telescope image of this particular region, which will show us more detail, but not the big field of view. So let's zoom in. And that's what we see, all right? This absolutely spectacular, colorful nebula called the Orion Nebula. And again, the colorful gas is lit up because some stars, having recently coalesced out of that gas, are shining light back into the surrounding cloud, ionizing the gas, and that's creating these beautiful colors. What is a star? All a star is is some of this interstellar gas that fills our galaxy, some of it in its turbulence gets caught up in dense eddies and if there's a dense enough uh, a little clump of gas it will collapse under its own gravitational pull so gravity tends to try to pull mass together turbulence tends to try to disperse it out so these clouds are kind of turbulent but if you get enough mass in a small enough volume the gravity will win it will collapse and if you have enough mass collapsing in in a small enough space the pressure in that collapsed gas will get very high. And in the core, the hydrogen atoms, most of the gas is hydrogen, the hydrogen atoms will fuse in a reaction that creates not only helium atoms as a product, but light photons. So you can actually see emitted light from this fusion reaction. That's what a star is. It's a little fusion reactor. reactor. Gas collapses, fusion begins in the core, light is emitted from the star. Star-forming regions have interesting characteristics. Here's another one of these uh, interstellar clouds. Stars have recently formed in the area off to the right here, but the radiation from these young stars comes back, and there are winds that come from the stars as well. They impinge the surrounding gas and actually carve out pillar-like structures. So we often see pillars in these interstellar clouds of gas and dust. They're carved out from the emissions from these recently formed stars. Big stars form fastest, they're most vigorous to form, and so they have this most power to carve out the, the surrounding gas. Smaller stars are still trying to form in this dense gas and dust that's left behind. So often if we look inside these denser regions, we can see younger proto-stars still trying to form. Here's another beautiful ethereal image. Um, this one is taken in infrared light. And so you can see more of the dust. Dust often emits in infrared in some wavelengths. 
and other wavelengths of infrared light, you can actually peer into and behind the dust. But in this case, we're seeing emitted light from this beautiful structure that has been named the Horsehead Nebula. It's also in the Orion region, and to me, it looks more like a dragon than a horse head. So you can interpret as you like. These clouds, gas, and dust, nebulae, fill the volume of what we call galaxies. So a galaxy looks, can look like this. The volume is mostly filled with gas and dust, although it's very sparse gas and dust. Uh, but it also contains hundreds of billions of stars. So stars fill galaxies, stars that have formed out of this gas. They can take on um, these windmill-like structures. There's so many stars in the cores of galaxies like this that the light all blends together, so you see these beautiful glowing cores. And again, we're in a section of my talk here called beauty, so I just want you to notice how spectacularly beautiful a spiral galaxy can be. We believe our own Milky Way looks something like this, but we can't get all the way out of the Milky Way to take a picture back. So we have to infer it from our place, which is about two thirds of the way out. Um, our sun would sit around about here along one of the spiral arms if this were the Milky Way. And when we look in different directions from our vantage point of our planet around our star, we see a lot more stars along the direction of the plane of the galaxy and a lot fewer when we look away from the plane of the galaxy. So if you ever do get the chance to go to one of these dark sky places and look up at night, you'll often see this kind of whitish path across the night sky. That's the blended starlight from looking along the plane of our own galaxy. Now this galaxy is spectacularly beautiful and if you look carefully in this image, you can see some other galaxies in the background. So uh, um, it's just a, a marvelous example of beauty, and I like to point out that it's so beautiful that astronomers called it NGC 1309. So uh, um, beauty means we need poets and things to help astronomers to interpret these things. Here's an artist's conception of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and again, our solar system would be about here, uh, near what we call the local or the Orion arm of our galaxy. We look toward the galactic center, we see a lot of stars, and in fact, if we look really close with, with good telescopes, you can see stars zooming around toward the center, and that gives us a clue that there's a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. This is a supermassive black hole is a condensation of sometimes billions of solar masses worth of mass in a very small volume, and so stars around the galactic center will have to orbit very fast to keep from falling in. So we can't see the black hole because light can't escape from it, but we can see action right around it. If we look in other directions, we see fewer stars, but we can see many, many star-forming regions in our galaxy. And we can even look, of course, out of the plane of the galaxy and see many other galaxies outside of our own. Telescopes are enabling us to see these things. So let me just take one little sidetrack here and tell you about telescopes. This is an example, this is the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a satellite, it's in space, that's why it's called the Space Telescope, but it's not very far away. It's in orbit around the Earth, just a few hundred miles above the surface of the Earth. But the reason it was put there in orbit is to get it above the atmosphere. So if you look down at the Earth here, you can see the atmosphere, you can see the clouds. The atmosphere blurs images and even blocks some wavelengths of light. So you wanna get above it to get the best images and that was the, the reasoning behind putting a telescope in space. This is about the size of a school bus and the mirror that's inside this telescope bus is about two and a half meters across. So it's not that big as far as professional telescopes go, but it's excellent because it's above the atmosphere. So we really appreciate this telescope. And now there are other space telescopes as well operating um, at different wavelengths, receiving things like X-rays and infrared light and other types of light as well as Hubble. And there's a whole suite of professional telescopes on the ground. While they have to deal with the atmosphere, they're also very good because many of them can be made much bigger than the Hubble telescope because they're built on the ground and they have specialized capabilities as well. So we use all these telescopes together in concert to get the fullest suite of information. There's a history here <coughs> of looking in the night sky that we are privileged to be 
um, well into here in the 21st century. So about four centuries ago on this chart, we have sort of the first record of somebody taking a telescope and making recorded observations in the night sky. Um, Galileo pointed a, a, a telescope up at Jupiter and he found these little blips of light moving over time back and forth on either side of Jupiter and realized these were orbiting bodies. We understand them as moons now orbiting Jupiter. And that set into play an understanding that our whole solar system operates this way, that the planets orbit around our sun. This chart shows you how over time, over the last four centuries, telescopes have gotten better. So the sensitivity of telescopes have improved over what you could just see with your bare eyes um, in a phenomenal way. The tick marks here on the y-axis are logarithmic. So every time you go up a tick mark here, you're going up an order of magnitude or 10 times more sensitive than the one below it. So we start with Galileo. And then as the years go by, telescopes got bigger, eyepieces got better, and the sensitivity improved by hundreds and thousands of times, orders of magnitude, so that with telescopes, astronomers could see star clusters and even uh, nebulae that we now know are galaxies outside of our own Milky Way. When photography was added on to telescopes, it allowed astronomers to receive light for long periods of time, longer than the eye could just stare through a telescope. And therefore, you could see very, very faint things in, in the universe. And then putting telescopes um, in conjunction with electronic recording made them even more sensitive. And then we put telescopes in space, and that really made the sensitivity jump up orders of magnitude. So here's the Hubble Space Telescope, launched in 1990. And over the years, this telescope has been serviced by astronauts repeatedly. And so every time the astronauts have gone up to the telescope, they've either repaired something or they have put in improved instruments. The last time we did this was a few years ago, 2009, and that mission was so successful that it took us off the charts here. Servicing Mission 4 has given us the most sensitive telescope we've ever had in the history of time, and it still is. So I just want you to know that what many of the philosophical questions that we are able to contemplate now are based on technology that has opened our eyes to the wonders of the universe that we weren't able to see before. Here's the happy astronauts that uh, did the last servicing mission a few years ago, and we're very grateful to them. They had to go out in spacesuits uh, for hours at a time and go out to the space telescope. The, the space shuttle was launched. It docked to the orbiting Hubble telescope. The astronauts went out um, several days in, in teams. Um, of course, they had to put on pressure suits so they could breathe and operate in the space environment. They would open up the side of the telescope, take out old instruments, put in newer science instruments or repair instruments in situ, and they just did a fantastic job. And one of the things they did was to install this new camera, the Wide Field Camera 3, that's giving us the detail in this star cluster image that I showed you earlier. However, it's helpful to see these images in context. The Hubble Space Telescope sees a very small field of view in great detail. But if you don't know where this cluster is, it doesn't give you a very good sense of what you're looking at. So let's zoom back a little bit and look at a broader field of view with a telescope on the ground. So a telescope on the ground looking toward the center of our galaxy sees a lot of dust and stars uh, toward the center of our galaxy. It's a very active place. And a lot of these bright stars turn out to be not stars, but actually very compact clusters of thousands of stars. And so we're going to zoom in on one of those clusters, if this will work. Whoops. Uh, okay. Oh, it's going to work. Okay. We're going to zoom in on what looks like a star and then transition over to the Hubble Space Telescope image so you can see the detail. All right, so this is the, in the Centaurus constellation. We're zooming in. It turns out what looked like a star there is actually a whole cluster of stars tightly bound together by gravity. And now we're going to transition over to the Hubble Space Telescope image where you can actually see those individual stars. So perspective is really important. Um, some people like to do that again. Anybody want to do that again? 
some people don't like to do that again, but uh, um, if you don't get seasick here, we'll, uh, we'll try that little journey again. So we're going to zoom into a globular cluster here. I don't like that violent constellation, but nevertheless, here we go. Zooming in and transitioning over to the higher detail but smaller field of view that we get with the Hubble telescope. And now we see those beautiful stars. Without a great telescope, we wouldn't have been able ever to discern that that blob of light actually consisted of thousands of stars. And now astronomers will go on from this point and start looking at these individual stars and taking spectra of them, looking at their light spread out um, in a spectrum so they can see the different frequencies of light that are emitted and to, to understand what the compositions are of these stars and to discern the different ages and different temperatures and different brightnesses and to say something about the history of this cluster. So there's science you can do beyond just uh, looking at the incredible beauty here. All right, so from beauty, I want to get across to you that our universe is active. It's not just stagnant. I know that I hope all of you think constantly about the activity of the universe that you're in. Um, but if you don't, let me, uh, let me tell you that we do live in an incredibly active universe. And I want to show you some examples. In our own solar system here, we have activity going on. Things like comets breaking apart. This is the nucleus of a comet uh, coming a little too close to the sun. And so with all the uh, interactions there, it's causing the comet nucleus to break up into lots of little pieces. Uh, this has happened numerous times. And in fact, a few years ago, a comet broke up and, and rammed right into Jupiter. And that was quite a spectacular sight. And speaking of Jupiter, there it is, a beautiful, beautiful image uh, taken just recently with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see Jupiter our neighboring uh, planet in our own solar system, but it's a huge gas giant planet. It's mostly gas. We think it might even be a, a failed star. It wasn't quite big enough to turn on as a star, but it's got layers of, of gorgeous atmosphere that's constantly changing. And this uh, giant red spot here as well, this is a giant hurricane, a giant storm. Um, we can also look at it in ultraviolet light, and in ultraviolet light, we see uh, a lot of activity on the poles of Jupiter. These are aurorae, just like we have aurorae or auroral lights on planet Earth. Jupiter has a bright aurorae dancing around. It's caused by magnetic fields, which are very strong around Jupiter. And when charged particles uh, from the sun and from interstellar space ram into the magnetic fields, they get diverted toward the magnetic poles of the planet and uh, light up in infrared light. So we can see that going on. It tells us something about the magnetic fields in Jupiter. And right now there's a probe that's gone to Jupiter called Juno. Anybody heard of the Juno probe? So Juno arrived recently. It's trying to get itself into a, a correct orbit around Jupiter and it's studying the magnetic field. So while Juno is studying magnetic fields, we with Hubble uh, other astronomers with Hubble can look and see how um, the magnetic field is, influencing, is being influenced by the charged particles uh, going into it and vice versa. So uh, it's a nice interplay. That big red spot we've noticed over the years is changing. It's actually shrinking. So the weather on Jupiter is not constant. It's changing as well. We even noticed activity on some of Jupiter's moons. Um, some very preliminary observations of Europa. Um, Europa is a moon of Jupiter that's covered in ice. Uh, seem to indicate that there might be water vapor escaping through cracks in that ice. Um, this is a crude image of, of Europa. It's an image taken by the Galileo probe. But this blue area indicates indications of water vapor being emitted as, as observed with a spectroscopic camera on the Hubble telescope uh, coming through the ice. Now, this is intriguing because for various reasons, it's thought that the core of Europa might be actually warm enough to melt the ice under the icy crust. So there might be a liquid ocean under the ice of Europa. And of course, an artist's conception shows a, an incredible geyser of, of, of water vapor coming out of, of the ice. So we have to do more study on that. The point is that the, even these moons are active 
If we move, move out of our solar system, we see interstellar clouds that are active. This is a famous image from the mid-1990s of the Eagle Nebula. Anybody seen this picture before? So uh, you've seen it on postage stamps. Um, they went back with Hubble and looked again a couple of years ago with the newer camera and could see more detail, a bigger figure, field of view, a broader range of colors. The interesting thing about this image is you can see signs of activity. Stars have recently formed. I mentioned to you that in star forming regions you often see these pillar like structures. But in this case, you can tell that there's some activity at the tips of these pillars. It's lit up. Turns out these are the dense regions left behind. The, the winds and, and radiation from young stars are off to the top of this image, are coming down, clearing out the less dense gas, leaving behind a little longer the denser clumps and the shadows behind them. So that leaves these long pillars. Well, these denser regions are exactly where you would expect more stars to form, because there's more stuff in the dense gas. But how do you see in there? It's dusty. Um, we can't see in there unless we have infrared eyes. Well, with the Hubble's new camera, we do have infrared eyes. That's the visible light image on the left and the infrared image on the right. It's the same region, but in infrared, you can see through some of that dusty veil, and you can see a lot more stars in the region as a whole, and you can see into some of these pillars where you see hotbeds of stars forming both in the pillars and up at the tips where it's very dense. So these regions of interstellar clouds are active. They're producing new stars. We call them protostars. You can see them at different stages of formation and heating up even before they start shining their own light from deep within these stellar nurseries. One phase of formation of a, of a star is that infalling material can get caught up in magnetic fields around this baby star and actually get expelled uh, because of the magnetic field activity. So here's a bipolar outflowing jet coming from a baby star trying to form in the middle of this dusty region here. You can't see the baby star, it's obscured. But this bipolar jet is a common uh, sight in star forming regions. This image was released uh, last December when the new Star Wars movie came out. So it was, uh, it was uh, called a double-bladed lightsaber in honor of the Star Wars movie. Um, and if you look carefully in this image, you can actually see some other jets from other young stars in this uh, cluster of baby stars. So stellar nurseries are active even in our own galaxy. New stars still forming. If we look around some of these forming stars, we see something interesting. So this is a zoom in back in the Orion Nebula. Um, here's some of these very bright, hot stars that light it up, especially right in here. But if you look carefully, you actually can see some other objects that are uh, not obvious at first. But I'm going to zoom in and blow them up. Here's a couple of them. These are little stars trying to form in this very turbulent, irradiated region. They may not make it all the way to stars, but they're heating up. You can see them here, and you see these dark regions around them. These are disks of dust. Um, depending on the orientation, they can be face-on like this or edge-on like this. These dusty disks are about the diameter of our own solar system if they were around our own sun, but these are other stars. And so we now understand, just from the last uh, decade or so of looking at these types of objects, that all stars, nearly all stars forming in our epoch of time form with these dense, dusty disks around them. These debris disks from the formation of the star provide the fodder for planets to form little solar systems of their own around these young stars. And in fact, here's a, a more detailed image of a disk region around another young star. Um, this was imaged with a radio telescope observatory in South America. And this is a real image. You can actually see that the disk is broken up into rings. And we often believe that ring structures are created when you have orbiting bodies, the rings of Saturn are shaped because there are moons around Saturn that help create that shaped structure. It could be that the rings around this young star are being shaped because of young planets forming around um, the star. And so this is an ongoing, very active field of study. 
How do planets form in disks around stars? And can we have see the activity or the presence of planets even just by looking at the ring structure? Planet formation is still active. Star formation is active, planet formation is active on the other end of a star's lifetime. So stars will shine depending on their mass for some millions of years. But then when they run out of that hydrogen in the core, they start to uh, lose their outer atmospheres and the instability there. And this is a, a, an example of an older star that's buried in the middle here, which you can't see. But as it starts to run out of its inner fuel, it becomes unstable. It starts releasing its outer atmosphere in these spectacular outflows. In this case, it's a bipolar-shaped outflow. And uh, some people think this looks like something. Anybody venture to guess what, what, what do you think this looks like? There's no wrong answer. All right, fish is right. Yep, it could look like a fish. What else? A butterfly. So this got dubbed the butterfly nebula, all right? And it's, it's quite beautiful in its own right. Uh, but it also indicates an aging star. And we think that our own sun, when it runs out of hydrogen, it will also become a, a nebula. Again, we, again we, we call anything kind of fuzzy a nebula, but this is a nebula not of star formation, but of star aging. Here's a more spectacular aging star, or actually the remnants of a star that became so unstable that it exploded. So massive stars bigger than our sun run out of fuel at a point where they explode into what's called a supernova, and that explosion is quite spectacular. This one happened about a thousand years ago, and we can still see the debris from that explosion of an ancient star. Um, it's called the Crab Nebula, and left inside here, which you can't see, is the remnants of that old star, a very collapsed core called a neutron star. The star produces heavier elements that are being expelled into the interstellar medium, and it can actually seed the next generations of stars and planets, and I'll talk much more about that tomorrow night in that lecture. But it's also spectacularly beautiful, the Crab Nebula here, observed by people in China and other places around the world a thousand years ago as they recorded seeing a star explode in the night sky. And then we can still see the debris a thousand years later. Galaxies, as I've mentioned, are, are beautiful, but they're also active. These regions of star formation fill the spiral arms of galaxies like this, of spiral galaxies. There are also uh, more spherical type galaxies and other shapes of galaxies. Galaxies can interact with each other. So here are two galaxies that are actually being drawn together by their mutual gravitational pull. And it turns out that the merging of galaxies is, has actually been a very common feature in, in the history of our universe. Galaxies in the distant past were small, and they were drawn together, merging by the power of gravity. When galaxies come together, when they collide, there typically aren't a lot of star-to-star -star collisions because most of the volume is empty space. But over time, and I mean long periods of time, eventually these galaxies come into the same space. Their mutual gravity and tidal tugs disrupt the structure, disrupt the spiral shapes. The galaxies merge into one galaxy, and the turbulence that's, that's brought about by this merger can incite a whole lot of new star formation in the interstellar gas. So here's another couple of galaxies that are a little farther along in the merging process. This is called the antennae galaxy pair. And you see all these bright spots here. Well, these are these nebulae that I've shown you before, like the Orion Nebula, but these are hot spots where star formation has recently been ignited because of all the turbulence from the merger of these two galaxies. We now think that most of the galaxies in our own epoch of the universe are products of mergers of smaller galaxies in the past. And lest you think this has no relevance to you, um, it turns out that as we look very carefully around the, in the galaxies in our local group around the Milky Way, that uh, our nearest neighbor big spiral galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. Any of you seen Andromeda with a backyard telescope or anything? You can see Andromeda with a telescope in, 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 in your backyard or astronomy clubs can easily see it. The Andromeda spiral galaxy is on a head-on collision course with our own Milky Way. Bet you didn't know that. Um, 
And so computer simulations show that this is what our night sky from planet Earth will look like as Andromeda gets close. And this is in the southern hemisphere where you can see the, uh, the Milky Way very strongly uh, from planet Earth. And this is what Andromeda will look like as we get closer and closer together. Now, the good news is that the models show there won't be a lot of disruption of individual stars and planetary systems. So I think, you know, we can be confident that our solar system, if it were still here, would be still in the night sky will look very different. The bad news is that our sun will probably have, have uh, burned out by this point because we're talking about billions of years from now. Okay, so this is uh, what the night sky will look like in about three billion years, all right, if we're still around. And then galaxies can be very, very active as a whole in amazing ways. Here's an entire galaxy here. This is a, this is a, a, a galaxy image. All these little bright spots here are galaxies as imaged with the Hubble telescope. Um, but the core of this galaxy has a very active, supermassive black hole. So material falling into that black hole on this large scale is caught up in magnetic fields, just like I mentioned for individual stars, caught up and expelled in these terrific outflowing jets, in this case moving completely outside of the host galaxy, way out into intergalactic space, creating these huge shocked lobes of gas the jets are moving nearly at the speed of light. This is a phenomenal discovery of active galactic nuclei. You wouldn't even see these lobes with just a regular optical telescope. These are picked up with radio telescopes. So you have to have radio telescopes to see this kind of emission and optical telescopes to see the galaxies. And to have that information brought together gives us a bigger picture and a better picture of what's going on. The universe is also enormous in both space and time, all right? I just want to give you just a little thought about this. I've already mentioned galaxies to you. Well, each galaxy, kind of like our own Milky Way, has at least something like 200 billion stars. The estimates can go up to as much as 500 billion stars in, in one galaxy, in our own galaxy. Our sun is just one star. We now know there are many of other, other galaxies. This is my favorite image from the Hubble Space Telescope. The telescope was pointed at a relatively boring direction of the sky where there weren't any nearby stars and just allowed to collect light for a long time. And this is the image that was produced, is an image showing not stars. There are a couple of nearby stars like this one in the image. But almost every blip of light here is an entire galaxy outside of our own Milky Way. So think of these galaxies. Each can contain billions or even hundreds of billions of stars, even the little ones. And this is only about the, uh, you know, the angular diameter of a, solar, of, a, of a soda straw in the sky. So then imagine this extrapolated over the entire sky. And you get a sense of how enormous the universe is. We now believe there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in our observable universe. Each one of them can contain billions of stars. So if you think about this and kind of do the math, in the observable universe, there's something like 10 to the 24th power stars um, in our universe. And it is really, really mind-boggling. Also keep in mind that some of these galaxies are closer to us and some of them are farther away. So there's a third dimension here and it takes longer for the light for the more, from the more distant galaxies to get to us. So we're seeing them at an earlier stage. Astronomy is a, like a time machine and I'll talk about that tomorrow night. Um, these images have made people amazed around the world. This, when this particular deep field came out in 2014, it made the cover of USA Today. Um, it also made the Huffing Huffington Post, which isn't normally reverent, but it uh, said, holy Hubble. Um, and as I mentioned, some of these galaxies are very distant, and that means that we're looking very far back in time. Here's a little dinky red galaxy, and as you blow it up, it just looks like a, 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 a not very exciting blob, but it's a, it's a not very exciting blob, which is very exciting because it's shining to us from within 
the first point eight of the 13.8 billion year old universe. So it's a very baby galaxy. Tomorrow night we'll talk about how the universe has developed over time. As our telescopes have gotten better and our cameras have gotten better over the years, that's what this is showing from top to bottom, we can see fainter and fainter things, which enables us to see farther and farther out, meaning more, more faint or more distant galaxies. So we're able to see galaxies now from not only very far out in space, but very far back in time. If we think of the beginning of the universe as being off to the right here, the universe began in a spectacular way, and we can now see baby galaxies from very close to the beginning of the universe. Um, I'll talk about that tomorrow as well. The universe also holds a lot of new things, mysteries, surprises, things we didn't know about, things like dark matter and dark energy, and I'll just say a few words about that. What is dark matter? Well, we don't know what it is, but it seems to be the major component of the mass in and maybe between galaxies. So this picture is a cluster of galaxies. That's what these yellow, yellowish things are. Clusters of galaxies are the most massive entities we know of in, in the universe. And the cluster here has so much mass that it can actually distort space-time. That is what Albert Einstein predicted. So this funny-looking thing here is a galaxy, a normal spiral in the background. But as the light comes around and through this cluster, it gets distorted by this distorted space-time and magnified. So it gets stretched out in this funny way. And also we can see more detail. It's like a magnifying glass. This is called gravitational lensing. And astronomers are using this to measure the dark matter because by seeing how much a background galaxy is distorted, you can map out where the dark matter is in a foreground cluster. So we don't know what dark matter is, but we know it's having an effect. It's having an effect on the motions of stars within galaxies, and it's having an effect on light coming from background galaxies. Here's a whole, another cluster of galaxies, and if you look carefully, you can see bluish arcs. These are distorted light arcs from background galaxies, again, being distorted and magnified by the dark matter that you can't see in the foreground cluster. What about dark energy? Here's our deep field again. Um, while nearby galaxies close to each other can merge, as I mentioned to you, most galaxies are actually moving apart from each other as the universe expands. This was discovered some decades ago, the expansion of the universe. Edwin Hubble is, is credited as having a big, a big part in discerning this by observing the rates of expansion of the universe, the, the, the apparent velocities as galaxies are caught along with the stretching of space. But just a few years ago, there was a surprise. By looking very carefully at nearby galaxies and distant galaxies and comparing their velocities away from us and kind of marking out a history of the universe's expansion, it was determined that the universe, the expansion of the universe, is not actually slowing down. I was always taught that the mass of these galaxies would pull back and slow down the expansion of the universe. What's happening, in fact, is that the universe appears to be accelerating in its expansion there's a tug of war between all this dark matter trying to pull things together and something that's pushing it apart, which we call dark energy because we don't know what it is. We don't know what it is, but these uh, three gentlemen got a Nobel Prize for detecting that that acceleration is going on. So that is an overview of beauty, activity, and mystery and magnitude of the universe. All right? Got it? Okay. Um, I hope that's given you just a taste that will make you even more curious to know more. But the title of this lecture is not just about the wonder, but it's about um, how we can respond. How do we respond to the grandeur of the heavens? Well, even theologian John Calvin centuries ago said astronomy is not only pleasant, but it's also useful to be known. It cannot be denied that this art unfolds the admirable wisdom of God. And we have psalms that talk about looking at the heavens. You know, most of the time in scripture, when the heavens and nature are mentioned, they aren't mentioned in terms of trying to understand exactly 
how they came to be in terms of the mechanics. The science hadn't been invented yet. But most often, nature, and in particular, I'm focusing on the heavens here, are mentioned in the context of praise for their creator. And of course, beautiful Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. And yet, there's no speech or language where this voice is not heard. Some translations say they have no speech, they have no language, and yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. There's something that the heavens tell us as human beings without using words. And that gets into philosophy. What is that message? Some have translated this, in, this feeling of awe into great hymns, the great hymn, How Great Thou Art. I'll spare you my singing voice, but uh, oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Great feelings of wonder. I often think if we contemplate the size and magnitude of the universe, it should also enrich uh, our prayer life, for those of us who are people of faith, it should enrich the way we think of praying and, and the one we're praying to. But you don't have to take that result from just looking at the heavens. Many people also have a different response. Um, physicist Weinberg says the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless, right? That's also a valid reaction. You can look and have a sense of bewilderment at the universe. Um, Pascal, again, thinking a bit more philosophically, but I think you can relate Pascal's feelings to what we sense when we look at the universe now. Um, his philosophical conclusion was that the eternal silence of these infinite spaces that he was thinking about frightens me. I think we can translate that thought into thinking about the spaces, both the very large and the very small, that we're studying scientifically. Um, sometimes we can feel a sense of bewilderment. Um, I think it's appropriate to kind of pause for a moment and talk about the perspective of faith, and we'll do more of this tomorrow and the next night, but um, let me just briefly say, uh, what is the perspective of faith? Can science and religion both address different types of truth? And I think it's helpful to remember that the scientific investigations we do are best at answering questions of the mechanics of how and when and why things happen in the natural world. Our biblical and faith-based perspectives are really good at answering these bigger, broader questions that our scientific tools aren't so good at. The bigger questions like why, capital W, is there a purpose, is there a God, and how, how should we live? So if we make sure we're using the right kind of tool to answer the right kinds of, the matching kinds of questions, we'll get a more satisfactory result. Sir John Polkinghorne is a physicist who became an Anglican priest, and he said that science and theology are both concerned with the search for truth. In consequence, they complement each other rather than contrast one another. Of course, these two disciplines focus on different dimensions of truth, but they do share a common conviction that there is truth to be sought. I think that's a very wise insight. Can the universe however, tell us something about the nature of God. I don't believe when we point our telescopes or microscopes at nature that it proves or disproves God. It, it basically tells us details about the mechanics of nature. But I think if you're looking at nature through eyes of faith, you can glean some philosophical inferences about the creator. And, and I would say, here's some of them that I came up with. You can came up with your own. But, but from looking at what we've seen in the universe, you could infer that the creator God is powerful and creative, a creator and a lover of beauty. We've seen beauty and also um, a creator of those who can appreciate beauty. We know what beauty is. It's hard to put our finger on it, but we know what it is when we see it. Um, a sense of patience, the universe developing over long epochs of time, which I'll talk about tomorrow. That's also true in our own lifetimes. Uh, spiritual development can take a long time. God is patient with us. F 
faithful. These fundamental laws of physics are not constantly changing all the time. And yet there's a sense of freedom within the physics. We have something called quantum mechanics that allows for a basic unpredictability or a basic uncertainty at the very core of our physics. Um, chaos theory also makes it hard for us to predict things. We have a sense that maybe God is appreciative of life. The universe is fruitful. At least on one planet we have life, and that life is able to think about itself and think about the universe out of which we were born. And I'll talk more about life uh, two nights from now. Um, is, is life filling the universe? Are we the only life? In either case, it's magnificent that we have a universe that's habitable for life. It's not all beautiful. There are also tough questions the science bring to us. Um, what will the long-term universe, future of the universe hold if the universe keeps expanding and accelerating and cooling off? Um, it's kind of a dismal sight. We'll talk about that tomorrow. How do we think about that? What about significance? A lot of people don't feel a sense of wonder and worship and appreciation. They feel mostly a sense of insignificance when looking at the vastness of the universe. Um, and maybe there are other universes, a multiverse. How should we feel? Well, I think all of these feelings are valid. You can feel that sense of, of, of smallness, but also a sense of appreciation. Um, astronomer Carl Sagan, Sagan pointed out that insignificance. He said, who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe. Pretty dismal, huh? <clears throat> but there's a different way of thinking about this. We are not, certainly, we are not in the center of the universe spatially, and our lifespans are insignificant compared to the time scales we see things happening in the universe. And yet, the psalmist looked out into the heavens, didn't know about distant galaxies, but could certainly see stars and, and the moon, and thought about significance in a different way. Um, he wrote, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've established, what are human beings that you're mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? And, let, and so that's that sense of insignificance. But then he went on and said, and yet you've made them, that means us, a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You've given them dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under their feet. I interpret that in part as scientific exploration. We can't visit most of these galaxies, stars, and planets that we're seeing. But we can study them, we can think about them, we can learn about them. That's a kind of dominion that it, it is possible to use in a way that glorifies God. And we've been given this capability. That, in a sense, is significance. There's other difficult questions for those of us on planet Earth. Um, why do the same processes that create mountains and continents, plate tectonics that recycle our atmosphere, also create such pain with earthquakes? Why do good things in creation uh, cause suffering at the same time? And what about the evil and suffering we cause one another? That's a different kind of question, but it, is, it does come up when we think about the universe. It's not all a rosy picture. I think as an example of what we do to other animals on this planet, this is just an example, but it tugs my heart. Um, elephants, for example, being machine gunned down just for their tusks. Um, is, this, is this okay? You know, Is this just part of the natural processes of the universe, or is there something truly evil about this? I think the, the latter. Um, I don't have time to go into all that. This is a theological issue. You can talk to your resident theologians about uh, these types of questions, but um, for Christians, the answer always comes to the incarnation, the fact that the God responsible for upholding the universe actually entered it, um, made of the same atoms that we are in Jesus Christ, and yet sovereign over it, suffering as we do, and yet sovereign over it. So the, the incarnation is the key to answering some of these more difficult questions. So in, how do we respond? We feel humility, awe, curiosity, praise. Hopefully we translate some of these feelings into, into stewardship for other creatures on this planet, including other human beings. And we continue to explore and learn 
Here's looking back at the Earth from the space shuttle after the servicing mission of the Hubble telescope, seeing the sun set behind the crescent of the Earth and seeing that very thin wisp of the Earth's atmosphere. It gives us a sense of both the beauty and the fragility of our own planet that we need to take care of. We can use science to lift the human spirit. Science can bring a sense of wonder, humility, even worship and praise. Here's my colleague Gladys Kober, also a member uh, of the American Scientific Affiliation. And she is a scientist. She works at Goddard Space Flight Center. But she takes her vacation time to go on mission trips. And this is a trip she took to an orphanage in Asia where she visited with some of the children there. Many of these children are children of martyrs, so they have had um, traumatized lives, but fortunately they have plenty of food and clothing. They're well cared for. So what these kids want to hear from Gladys is about space. They're excited about everything any kid you've ever known, and including yourself, was interested in. They want to be astronauts. They want to know what space exploration is like. So she goes over as a missionary of science and uplifts their spirits by telling them what we're learning about space. Here's another student. This is a, a student in a classroom of students that are visually impaired that I spoke to some years ago um, at the Maryland School for the Blind. And these students were very interested in space exploration too and were very excited about what we're learning in the heavens, but they were seeing these images through tactile encoded uh, uh, images of space so the nebulae would feel different from a planet which, fe which felt different from a galaxy which feel felt different from stars so you could feel the differences um, with your fingers and really get a sense of the same activity and beauty in these images that we see with our eyes and these students were every bit as excited as we are and even scientists can be inspired in the lab I want to rep recommend this book uh, by Ruth Bankowitz called God in the Lab, How Science Enhances Faith and How Scientists Get Excited About Their Work in the Lab in Terms of Their Faith. And finally, there are places of worship that uh, bring in visually um, the heavens into their own worship spaces. So this is the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and they have their own stained glass window called the Space Window, which you can visit. There's also stained glass at um, St. Paul, the Apostle Catholic Church, which is near Johnson Space Center in Texas. And they've used Hubble Space Telescope images in an artistic way throughout the sanctuary to give people a sense of wonder and awe while they are worshiping there. I will, um, I think I'm at the end of my hour. Um, unless I can have five more minutes, so I don't know how, how strict we are here. Okay, so what I, was, what I would like to show you, which I may show you tomorrow night, haha, -ha, um, is a little five-minute video from St. John the Apostles' Church about these windows and how inspiring it has been for the worshipers there, including many astronauts over the years who have been part of this parish. All right, if you want some more resources, by the way, this is the 25th anniversary image from the Hubble telescope of stars recently forming out of this gorgeous cluster. Using visible and infrared light combined, we can see both the birthplaces of stars and stars recently born, showing both beauty and activity in the universe around us. And I just want to point out a few interesting resources here, including, I think tonight what I'll point out is one book called The Book of the Cosmos, Imagining the Universe um, from Heraclitus to Hawking. This is a, an anthology of, of pieces of literature from throughout history put together by a literary professor, Dennis Danielson. And it's wonderful pieces of literature that can inspire you in different ways about the heavens. Um, and we've mentioned um, the American Scientific Affiliation already. All right. I gave this talk to a group of doctors, uh, medical people, women in medic medicine and dentistry, uh, a talk similar to this. And one of the physicians, Dr. Powell, went back, this was at a conference, went back to her hotel room that night and came back. She was so inspired. Came back the next day and shared with me 
this paraphrase of the 23rd Psalm that had come to her heart that night after seeing some of these images. So those of you who've memorized the 23rd Psalm, you'll recognize it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. For Dr. Powell, the paraphrase is the Lord is my galaxy maker. And she's, she wrote, the Lord is my galaxy maker, I shall not want for praise. He makes me lie down in green pastures and upwards look. He leads my gaze to behold his heavenly glory, and thereby he restores my soul. He leads me in colored paths of awe and wonder for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for he is with me. His nebulae and star clusters, even their interstellar gas, comfort me with assurance of power and majesty. He prepares a tapestry of stars before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my mind with the joy of speechless discovery. My eyes overflow with tears. Surely hallelujahs and praise shall fill all the days of my life, and I will dwell in a celestial house forever. Amen? Amen. All right. With that, I'm going to uh, invite our discussant up. But thank you very much for your attention. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Wiseman. We appreciate that very much. It's uh, always good to be humbled in a lot of the, uh, the all and the majesty of God. So we thank you uh, very much. At this time, please allow me to introduce our respondent. Uh, who will have 10 minutes here to respond, uh, Dr. Leslie Wickham. Uh, Dr. Leslie Wickham uh, was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. She graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. She later earned a master's degree in aero-astro engineering as well as a doctoral degree in human factors and biomechanics from Stanford University. For over a decade, she worked as an engineer for Lockheed Martin Missiles in Space in Sunnyvale, California. While there, she had the opportunity to work on NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and International Space Station programs. Uh, she received commendations from both NASA and contractors for her contributions. During this time, she was designated as Lockheed's corporate astronaut. Following Lockheed Martin, she moved to wet labs in Universal City, California, where she was instrumental in the development and programming of the Fountains of the Bellagio in Las Vegas, Nevada. After that, she spent several years working as a research scientist with the RAND Corporation in Santa Monica, California on technical and political aspects of various national defense issues. She currently acts as Program Director of Engineering as well as Director of the Center for Research and Science at Azusa Pacific University. In addition, she serves as an engineering specialist on various aerospace projects. And currently, her primary research project involves investigating the effects of climate change on national security issues. Uh, Dr. Wickham was also a professional athlete, uh, as well as currently a, a Christian minister. Um, we're delighted to have someone of Dr. Wickham's stature with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Leslie Wickham. Thanks very much. It's uh, an honor to be here and participate in this series. Um, I should also mention that I'm the current executive director of the American Scientific Affiliation and uh, follow in some um, very uh, uh, significant contributors to that organization, in, including Bob Herman, uh, whose name this lecture series bears, as well as Randy Isaac, who is also in the audience with us today. So again, it's an honor to be here. And thank you, Jennifer, for your thoughtful and wonder-filled presentation. Um, I loved what you had to say about how we can discern at least some of God's characteristics through the universe he's created. Uh, I've always felt that God's extravagant love for us is reflected in the universe that he created. This is a world where we can flourish and thrive uh, and wonder and even express our own Imago Dei creativity. It's not one where we can barely survive with every breath possibly being our last. So I resonate with much of what you talked about today. So thank you for that so much. And I have some additional thoughts to offer for further consideration on this topic, uh, particularly with regard to awe and wonder. And it seems to me that 
awe, wonder, inspiration, and praise are all inextricably linked. The night sky has always inspired awe and wonder in me, even as a young child, when my father would take my brothers and I outside on clear starry nights to look at the moon and the stars and the planets through his telescope. Growing up in a Christian home and coming to faith at an early age, I always believed in my heart that God was the source of all this wonder we were studying. And when I was teaching astronomy to university students, I would frequently take my classes outside on clear starry nights to look at the thousands of stars visible to the naked eye from Earth. Gazing at the heavens, people both young and old inevitably start asking the same questions that have been asked through the ages, many of which Jennifer referred to. Where did all this come from? How big is it? What's it all made of? How long has it been here? Was there anything before all this? Where are we going? How will it end? And at least as importantly, the more personal questions of why am I here? What is my purpose? And these questions are not just questions for scientists, but for all of us who inhabit the Earth. For instance, Vincent van Gogh wrote to his brother Theo saying, the sight of stars always sets me dreaming. Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn says, we had the sky up there all speckled with stars, and we used to lay on our backs and look up at them and discuss about whether they was made or only just happened. And as Jennifer mentioned earlier, King David wrote in the book of Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands, day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. Starry nights do that to people. They make us think and feel and wonder about the big questions in life. Scientists and other keen observers are perpetually amazed by the intricacy and complexity of everything we study. Yet it all fits together seamlessly in a perfectly balanced and synergistic system. For example, one of our big questions has to do with the vastness of the universe. Now on the clearest night, we can only see about 2,000 or so stars with the naked eye from Earth. But recent surveys now estimate that there may be 10 trillion or more galaxies within the observable universe. And an average galaxy may have about 100 billion stars. So the total number of stars would come out to about 10 to the 24th, or a septillion stars in just the observable, the observable universe. The vastness of the universe is impossible for most of us to even begin to comprehend. The observable universe is thought to extend about 45 billion light years in every direction, or 90 billion light years across. And the whole thing, observable plus unobservable, might be 250 times or more bigger than that. And if this thing is so big, that leads to yet another big question. Maybe there are other intelligent be beings out there somewhere, but I digress. Liter li literary scholar and critic Peter Nichols describes awe as being a conceptual paradigm shift in which we recast a previous narrative in a larger context. Katherine Johnson, a psychology faculty member at Arizona State University writes, any amazing or information-rich encounter that challenges one's ability to comprehend can elicit awe. Awe is an emotion that arises when we try to comprehend or accommodate new information that challenges, disorients, or overwhelms our existing knowledge structures. Psychologist Dr. Keltner, who's at the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, interesting place, and Jonathan Haidt at New York University explain awe this way. Awe involves being in the presence of something powerful along with associated feelings of submission, a difficulty in comprehension, 
along with associated feelings of confusion, surprise, and wonder. From an evolutionary biology perspective, science writer and self-proclaimed bioneer, Adam Sinecki, postulates, you might see how feelings of awe and wonder, which inspire a fair amount of fear and respect, could be useful for helping us to avoid potential dangers. We feel in awe of lions and other animals that are powerful and alien to us. And this might be one of the feelings that helps us avoid getting too close. We feel in awe of huge heights, and perhaps this is one of the things that prevents us from jumping. Now bear in mind that our understanding of anything can be layered with various explanations, filling in pieces of the big picture. For example, the question, why am I here, could be answered in various ways. The scientific explanation might reference the union of ovum and sperm and physiological development in the fetus in a mother's womb while a relational explanation might reference a couple's desire for a child. And a spiritual explanation might refer to God's purpose or calling for a specific individual. The how explanation of the process does not negate the why explanation of higher purpose, as Jennifer referred to. I would like to suggest that looking at the world with awe, wonder, and curiosity led to the early Greeks' practice of natural philosophy, which was simply the search for understanding through the study of the physical world. They believed that nature could be understood and that the diverse behaviors observed in nature were held together in rational patterns. Over time, practice showed that inductive reasoning worked better than ph philosophical deduction in combination with empirical observations. And this then led to the establishment of what we now know as modern natural science. When scientists wonder about something, we make observations, formulate tentative explanations, make predictions, do experiments, and create models or theories to answer questions, all for the goal of obtaining a compelling explanation describing observed phenomena which makes accurate predictions and leads to a better understanding of the universe. Proverbs 25.2 reads, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search it out. It is in our human nature to want to try to figure things out, to understand everything we possibly can. Again, bearing in mind that our understanding of complex concepts is layered with various explanations filling in different pieces of the big picture. Is it possible that awe and wonder that we experience when looking at God's creation, in addition to their evolutionary roles, that awe and wonder are purposed by God to engage us in this interplay, to lure us into searching out not only the wonders of his creation, but also to beckon us to search out God himself as the source of all creation, including of our very selves. Perhaps this idea is what St. Paul had in mind when he wrote in Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. Awe and wonder are a great starting place for inspiring us all to seek, learn, and discover all we can about God and the universe we inhabit. As Albert Einstein wrote, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. Finally, in closing, I believe that science is simply the tool we use for discovering God's creativity and wisdom in the wonders of nature. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this fascinating dialogue.